Uh, so we're here with Emma Forrest, writer-director of Untogether. Thanks for being here, Emma. Thank you for having me. So uh, I, I love the film, and I'm just wondering, first off the bat, uh, what, what's your personal stake in this movie? Why this project? My stake? Oh, my personal stake is a big one, which is that I'm, you know, the archetypal person who's been living in LA for a decade, getting paid to write films that don't get made. And I didn't feel my soul could survive much longer of that. You know, it's great to be able to make your rent, but if you actually think you're a good writer and nobody's seen it in the world, you know, and you end up on lovely lists of, you know, the best unproduced, you don't want to be the best unproduced writer in Hollywood. That's a painful place to be for over, you know, for 10 years. Um, and David Michaud, who directed Animal Kingdom, had said something that really struck me about why he made that film after being a writer, and that was that the films that don't get made, it's like unfinished architecture. And that phrase really stuck with me, and I was like, I, I just, I have to make one. Because I got so close, you know, mm -hmm. on your voice in my head and on Lives A to E. Um, I just, it was starting to make me ill. <laughs> That's my personal stake. Uh, so, do you think we'll ever see Liars ADE or...? Do you know what? It would take a, 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 a dedicated, loving producer who really cares about untangling. I think there's a little bit of untangling to do because that was a Miramax. I think that was right when Miramax collapsed. Um, but there are people who want to. There's people who want to. Yeah, well, if it's the idea you keep coming back to, and you've got to consider it right. Yeah. Yeah, I mean that at this point is a period piece, right? Because it's all set during the election of Obama. Mm -hmm. Maybe people's souls would be soothed by right. having that, that optimistic period dystopian fiction piece. Sure. Now. The more time goes on, the more interesting Perhaps. parallels it yeah. might have. Yeah. Um, and what about uh, Voice in My Head? Do you think that'll ever Yeah, surface? I actually, um, I might direct that next. Because it's been so long since I wrote the book. I say that, by the way, with the confidence of someone who is believing that they'll ever be allowed to direct another film again, but let's just go with that version. Um, that casual, I might direct that next. I'd like to direct that. Um, I feel I have enough distance on it, and you may or may not know there were directors that got really close uh, on making that one. And uh, yeah, but I think it. It, hey, I've lived in California long enough to be allowed to say things all happen for a reason. And I think that maybe I am the one that's meant to direct it. So how about um, the level of autobiography in Untogether? What's your personal stake emotionally or thematically? I mean, always. Everything. It, 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 she even says it in the film, you know, when, when it hits the page, it's mine. Um, uh, I think it... You, you might be hard pressed to find a female writer director who doesn't believe in the Nora Ephron maxim that everything is copy. Um, for me, it's sort of about taking experience and straining it through imagination. That's something I talk about a lot um, because really, because I wrote it when I just got together with Ben Mendelssohn and all of the characters are a combination of me and him. And what was fun was taking the the um, like the more obviously Emma character, which was Jemima, and imbuing her with Ben qualities, and then taking the character that Ben was playing and feeding him lines that I'd said to him, uh, you know, consistently, and hearing him say it back with like real authority, things that he'd actually been furious at me for saying. Um, it's. The, the, the things that I love are personal. I'm interested in, in people. Like when I get in a cab, I want to know the driver's story. So when I see a film, I want to know about the person making it and the way to know is there in the words and in the visuals. Yeah, so how has your extensive journalism background kind of influenced maybe your screenwriting style in terms of observing real life characters? It's actually, it, it's, more being really good emotional prep for um, having a lack of sentimentality about what you have to cut uh, because I got so used 
over so long to working hard on a piece I really cared about and then you'd open up the newspaper and like you know three paragraphs in the middle were missing and you live with it and you know it is the classic um, ap apocalypse now redux Uh, theorem where you know that has some of the best work that Coppola's ever done but it stops the story dead so it, it can be there and I'm really on precious about cutting and I think I was and actually people around me the producers were quite pleasantly surprised about that um, sometimes there was an actor or two who was less pleasantly surprised like, well we're gonna lose that scene um, but yeah I'm pretty at ease with that. Is that a skill that you've developed, kind of being able to distance yourself from your work and brutally? No, I mean, I, 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 I not only accept the idea that there's the film that you write, the film that you make, and the film that you edit, but I delight in that. Like that was just fucking glorious for me was to be in the edit suite and go, well, I wasn't going to take it this way, but now I'm seeing it. I really love it. That's not how I wrote it. Or you know, there's a scene in the film with Ben and Jemima. Um, I'm not even going to say what happens because I realised as it happened watching with an audience they were genuinely surprised when it did. Something happens that was meant to be, you know, gentle and accidental and I was just watching those two together, they worked so well together and we took it a whole other, um, much more aggressive, uh, angry, overpowering way. and. Um, you know, Ben said that was one of the best days he'd had shooting since Place Beyond the Pines. And that is pretty thrilling to hear, just the idea that it's quite rare to have a director just sort of tear it up on the day and say, let's just go this way. So how was the transition from uh, novels and, uh, and to screenwriting? I, mean, oh yeah, I, I think that's where there's l personally less of a transition because actually novels for me they're the hardest because you know you get to page 350 and sometimes it's hard you've been alone for so long you're like i don't even fucking remember how old the character is like or what weather i said we were living through or what month it, it's just so easy to lose your way with a novel um that's the toughest thing i found and i actually think that someone like me who can get um lost in sort of like almost the uh New Orleans jazz parade of dialogue that it's a really good discipline to be working under you know the structure of a screenplay like there are um, you only have a certain length of time to say what you mean yeah so it was a positive exercise then kind of how the process differed you had to I loved be it. a little more I, love, I sound so overconfident but if I do and I don't mean to sound arrogant it's really just I loved the experience so much awesome <laughs> Um, can you tell me a bit about your mood board for the film? Yes, I can. Um, we had, uh, I knew that for the rabbi I wanted someone who had been iconic for so long and who we've watched age that you really feel in safe hands with them. And it's also someone where um, you look at them now and you remember how beautiful they were as young men. So I had. I had pictures of Martin Sheen, I had pictures of Donald Sutherland. Um, I, it never crossed my mind that I could get Billy Crystal. It was just extraordinary to me. And then all made perfect sense because, you know, surprise, surprise, a really great comedian is a fantastic straight actor. That was, that was, uh, that was pretty special. And how about the um, differences in age in the relationships? What was uh, your intention of kind of making that a theme? Um, considering whether or not, how carefully to tread with this. Um, when I was a teenager, I was always around people who were too old and I thought I was in control and that um, uh, it took getting older to realize the ways I just didn't know what the fuck I was doing and that I was probably just a brat. And um, then what was important to me is I think with Ben and Lola together, um, you really, or partly because it's Ben and he's just so brilliant, 
you really believe he just he loves her like it's I wanted to present a version of an older man and a young and a much younger girl where it wasn't um, you know salacious or unpleasant or judgmental and you just really really do feel how much he adores this girl right that's that's such kind of a culture especially in Hollywood yeah um, that it's it's interesting to subvert yeah I mean I like think that's a female gaze version of our older man younger girl relationship mm -hmm. and you've described this film as a female fantasy yeah right um, and you just coincidentally you had all female department heads right it was right? just amazing that I was halfway through shooting and I think Jemima turned to me and said you know you've hired all female department heads and I had no idea I'd done it um, they were just the ones who when I met them they were able to translate back to me what it was I was trying to say because again I mean you may have heard me speak about this it's so strange to make a film because you have a dream you hurry to write it down and then you show it to someone and they give you money to make it it's just bizarre. So you really need this crew around you who are able to translate a dream into something that will make, that will connect with an audience, you know, and whether that's um, Cameron Lennox, uh, my costume designer, who we talked about putting um, Jemima's character, Andrea, in. She's just someone who needs to be held and helped and we put her in a lot of angora and mohair and just, you know, like, just touch, just touch me and stroke me, just please help me. Um, and yeah, that's part of getting the dream to the screen. And, and actually you had asked about journalism and when I started journalism, it was music journalism. And it has felt very close making a film to trying to describe how music sounds because that is such a hard thing to do. Like the best rock critics are just as good as any writer out there. Um, and with the film, you're just, you're really trying to pinpoint specific emotions so that people say, oh, I understand how that feels. I mean, if you're making a certain kind of film, right? You know, you're maybe not trying to do that with Pacific Rim, but well, yeah. Even maybe Pacific you are. Rim, yeah, <laughs> but no, I, I definitely get what you're saying. Um, and it, it felt like a very deliberate dream. It, it felt like you, you realized it very... Um... Yeah, you know, it, uh, uh, it was appropriate for me to start, to, to begin, to do my first film as director small, you know. Basically with people talking and landscapes that make me feel. Um, the only way it, it could have been an um, easier first time as exercise was it if it was just you know people talking in a room, but that's not interesting to me. I'd really fallen in love with the magic of Los Angeles, and I felt like I hadn't seen that on screen, um, with sort of that esoteric um, dreaming board quality. You get there, and that's where Autumn Durald, my DP, comes in, because she just, it's just so, beautiful and everything she does looks much more expensive than it is um, and she's the queen of natural light um, and just evoking emotion through these incredible landscapes she shot yeah I was I was gonna ask what was it about her work that convinced um, you she was right for this project well I really loved her work in Palo Alto um, what we talk there were several people in the movie who I was incredibly close to who were in the same position of me, which is that they had had children and felt like they had stepped back from their career to a point, you know, and that they were ready to express that part of themselves again. Autumn was very, very pregnant when we first met. I had had my baby. Jemima has two young children. And for all of us, we were very connected in, in needing to reclaim that part of ourselves, the creator. And you also mentioned um, that Linklater advised you to find an editor you really liked because yeah, you were spending exactly. so you much know, time. The, there was the awful heartbreak of Liza to E where it collapsed in pre-production and it's like, 
that is a fucking traumatic thing to get over almost having a Richard Linklater film made but then there was the joy of being able to reach out and say I'm directing my first film do you have any advice and he did say um, hire an editor who you actually really like as a person because you're going to be alone with them in a small room for a really long time and I really liked Sophie Cara I loved her work in Love and Friendship because that was a period piece that just felt so modern um, and when I, I, it's interesting actually, my three favourite um, editors of the last year, Jennifer Lame, who did um, Meyerowitz stories. Yeah, Meyerowitz stories. Uh, Tatiana Riga, who did I, Tonya, where those were just seamless, those cuts between her and, and, um, and Sophie <laughs> in the edit room. And I, you know, that's, you hear a lot correctly from Walter Murch, you know, he's someone who actually is an ambassador for what it is to be an editor. Uh, but these women are just, they're extraordinary and they seem to see things a different way. Yeah, the, the movie had a, it, it was subtle, but it was a unique kind of style of yeah. editing. Um, especially in the scene where the two affairs came to a head, the yeah. concert and yeah. at the synagogue. Yeah. Um, what were maybe some of the challenges or breakthroughs that you had in the editing room? Do you know what was great was that um, we found our editorial breakthroughs out of absolute need. It was a 20-day shoot. It was meant to be a 21-day shoot. We lost the final day, and the final day was going to be when we shot Transitions. It is a film with no transitions. And we had no choice but to work with that and say, right, this has to be a stylistic decision. This is the look of the film. You know, what do you do so it's not just face, cutting to face, cutting to face, you know. It was really a very hard one to crack, um, that intercut specifically, but we did. Um, something that I don't have there that Autumn and I and Sophie had really wanted, it's very much in the script, is the wildlife of LA. Like I'd, We have the coyote, but I had wanted to shoot that the owls and the freaky possums and the raccoons and I wanted those to be my transitions and we we did lose that day so um, you just have to dream that part keep that in reserve for the next <laughs> yeah. film um, that's that's funny because I, I thought it was very stylistically deliberate that you know there weren't so many showy transitions and it was kind of character to character Dude, it was deliberate because we were fucked Why? <laughs> <laughs> well it, it, I didn't really notice it didn't seem like something was missing so Good. it goes to show Success. how Thank you, you. Know, the, how you can fix things in that yeah, yeah. Um, and so this is the first time that the Kirk sisters appear together yeah. on screen. Yeah. Um, so could you describe the the force of nature, the two of them, maybe what sets them apart from other actors or, or from each other? They, oh my gosh, they're, they're just both, they're so different. They're such massive characters. Um, they struggle with their relationship and they've talked about that they love each other very much but they're both enormous characters um i was thinking about it i was thinking how do i describe to people the essential difference between jemima and lola and um <laughs> actually the rocky horror show came to me and jemima's magenta she's like i will have the roots of your soul and lola is columbia because she seems all American like tap dancing, wee jazz hands, but she's actually really wanton. Um, and I think because Jemima is such a, a femme fatale, Lola almost was expected to grow up being a tomboy. And that's part of her that is that, but that's really not at her core. She's profoundly sensible. Um, they're, they're just, they're, they're amazing. And how about the gender roles explored in the film? How do you want your film to fit into the conversation at large? Oh, that's happening right now. Oh, um, I mean, I think that the men in the film, there's no villains in the film. Like, there's essentially good people who do bad things um, and feel bad about it. And very early on, Ben, ben had always said, I'm going to be your secret weapon on this film. And he has said something that really 
struck me, which is, if you ask him why are you so good at playing bad characters, he said, well, his touchstone as a young, young, young actor was Rizzo in Greece, because it was the first time that it occurred to him that the villain could be desperately sad, that, that you know, there was pain behind that aggression. Um, and I think that really permeated the characters, all of them, actually. Because Jemima's character does things that are unkind, but she's just, you know, she's, she's trying. She's trying, and that felt really good, is that we were actually shooting during the election. That's how long we edited for. Um, and to have to go back to work the day after the election, and I knew I had to talk to my crew because we were just all zombies. Um, I said, it, it, it's, it's one, this is a really good time to be making art. <laughs> Artists, make your art now. Um, and also we're making a film about people trying to be kind, like trying to find a way to be good people. And that in itself is a protest piece. Because when you're watching films now, Everything seems like it's a Trump protest piece. Like, you're watching Planet of the Apes, you're like, clearly the Woody Harrelson is meant to be a stand. You know, it's everywhere. But just to make a love story where people are trying to be kind is a protest, in right. my mind. No, yeah, it's, it's hard to, you know, make a film that doesn't get that um, yeah. projected onto the yeah. story. It would be really interesting to see the, you know, the academic film criticism that's written about this time, 10 or 15 years from now. Yeah, definitely. I, I think it's... You know, uh, there are a lot of very actively political films with a strong agenda, yeah. but even the ones that are, you know, maybe a more uh, personal human story yeah. still kind of get that. Yeah. Um, I mean, my two favorite films of last year were Florida Project and Phantom Thread, which are just from completely different worlds and stratas and classes and times. Um, and they both brought me so much joy. But, you know, Florida Project is on the one hand, you know, a Huck Finn story, like in a, just a fantastic, entertaining film about childhood from a child's perspective. And then it's also an extremely political film about poverty in America. You know, I just loved it. So what were some of the techniques you learned as a writer to convey the emotional beats that you wanted in your screenplay in terms of kind of paring well, down? I, you know, I had to listen to my actors that it, occasionally there were lines that I didn't have to listen to my actors, but I chose to listen to my actors. Um, and there were times occasionally when to get to the authenticity, you'd have to listen to Jemima when she said, I just I can't find a way to say this line. I'm like, fuck, it's a fucking great line. Okay, but let's bin it. Um, with Ben, you know, I don't want to give away like the fantastic first moment on screen that Ben has um, and he was like no you're, you're, you're blowing this this is not you know the correct uh, emotional tenor for the piece it needs to be the other way around to really express where he's at and I listened to him I didn't know if he was right but um, it works emotional tenor no pun intended yeah. um, everything we initially assume about Jamie is true. Yeah. How, how does that factor into your philosophy as a writer and the kind of stories you want to tell or think are important creatively? Well, I always really read, one of my favorite books when I was a little girl was Cat's Cradle by Kurt Vonnegut. And at the very, very front of the book, before the book starts, it says, live by the harmless untruths that make you healthy and happy. And then when I was a teenager, late, when I was an older teenager, I was really hooked on the line by Courtney Love in the whole song where she says, um, I fake it so real I am beyond fake. Liars are very rich cinematic characters, obviously. Um, and then Jemima says to Lola, we, we all lie. And Lola says, I don't. But we do, and, and you know, they're lying to yourself, the little white lies that ease a relationship, the moments where you tell the truth and maybe you shouldn't have told the truth. Um, there's just, there's, there's obviously a, a, a great cinematic tradition there for good reason, because it's great for writers, great for an actor, 
Um, and for Jamie, he sort of got to do two roles in one, almost. Um, and he's just glorious. Not, I mean, I love the fall so, so, so much. Um, and then to have him show up and he's just the nicest, easiest. Um, I mean, that guy could have anything he wants. When you're that, that talented, which I think people are really gonna see in this film, you're that you know conventionally handsome and you're just like a solid pleasant dude who makes the set so much easier and so much happier he was just an absolute joy like i would work with that guy forever if he'd have me <laughs> awesome i want the film to get out there and be seen of course because i want my work seen but i also really want it out there for jemima because when I was watching in the edit suite and then when I watched it with an audience, it just felt like a star is born. It felt like watching Maggie Gyllenhaal in Secretary, like, what's happening? You know, you can just, it's really hard to blush on screen. She blushes, you just feel the blood moving under her skin. And I think that um, there's always a place in Hollywood for a woman in her 30s who's a really good actor and considered beautiful, but has an interesting face um, and seems intelligent like that's why Rachel Weisz got her breakthrough in Hollywood that's why Jennifer Connelly had her moment and I feel that that could be Jemima that she really could end up with some very very interesting roles yeah she was um, she was terrific your exploration of human nature in the yeah. film it's a lot of very lonely characters yeah. who kind of self-sabotage yeah. whether it's individually or in their relationships yeah. what made that kind of a theme you felt had to be kind of almost omnipresent in all the film's characters? I think that um, there's nothing lonelier. There's nothing, it's the worst thing in the world to feel alone when you're in a relationship. Um, and that's Martin, Ben's character. Um, and then I also had thought a lot about, I've, I've always thought a lot about Cat Stevens and how um, he's really the symbol of how easy it is to fall through one wormhole that's music, into another that's addiction, into another that's religion, um, and how closely interlinked they all are. So you could say the whole film, although we have not a note of his music, is kind of underpinned by Cat Stevens and just how much I've thought about him over the years in that moment when he was an incredibly famous musical star with an addiction issue who nearly drowned and came out and found God and he was Greek Orthodox and became Muslim um, I thought about him with each of these characters and their and their quest and their inherent decency that feels really on point for me the yeah. I thought the movie had kind of an emotional spirituality to it yeah. these characters are trying to reconcile their lives and just their interpersonal relationships yeah. in a very meaningful way yeah thank you yeah uh, was Cat Stevens on the mood board? Um, the, yes, I have a picture of him as a young, um, what Ben would call a sesamu, as he calls a, a sexy young person, a sesamu, um, and as a, you know, very sort of um, rabbinical or imam looking, uh, long bearded, older, lovely gentleman. And that they're, you know, they're the same person, that's the same human body, and that transfiguration is real, that you can change. Is, otherwise, why would you bother staying alive if it weren't always possible at any point to change? <laughs>